Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, topping the Western charts from China. And it's a subject that I hear more and more people talking about is how do we embrace a global opportunity for game development um, with regional development teams. And um, Kabam as a company, and we'll talk more about this in a bit, has uh, basically been very fortunate to build a game from our China office in Beijing uh, that is now one of the top grossing apps in many of the Western markets. And I'd like to share with you what we learned by doing that. Uh, in the hopes of helping you uh, with your development efforts as well. So a little bit on myself, uh, although I do hate this slide, it feels obligatory, but it's important. Um, so I head up the, the studios at Kabam. Um, have an interesting background actually. I did not start out in game development, I started out more in professional services. Um, but I transitioned into the gaming industry working at EA. I worked on a game called Spore, which is not to be confused with this country. Um, or its, its nickname. Um, that game was a game developed by Will Wright. Uh, he's one of the most famous Western uh, designers, I would say, who also produced The Sims, Sim City, uh, hopefully titles that you've all played. And uh, my focus there was on multi-year franchise strategy and specifically looking at growth opportunities outside of traditional packaged products. Uh, by way of that work, I started to learn much more about the microtransaction-based model, which is prevalent here in Asia. I uh, got very excited about that and the potential for it in the Western markets. And that prompted me to jump into a startup called Outspark, which was a publisher of Korean free-to-play MMORPGs. And uh, that was an excellent experience for me because um, at that time in the US, monetization best practices were very immature. And having the opportunity to work with Korean developers and to understand the five to 10 years of experience they had at that time was a real blessing. And I uh, took away a lot from that. And then after that, I went to High Five. And at High Five, focused on transforming that social network into a social gaming destination, um, was able to start with a foundation of traffic, which was different than Outspark, which was growing traffic as it went, and uh, did a number of different projects. But ultimately, virtual currency platform, premium apps, uh, flash game portal, uh, in partnership with Mochi Media, actually. We got that up to 20 million uh, uniques, a third-party publishing platform for games from Playdom and Rock U and then ultimately an internal development studio. And when I uh, started up the internal development studio, I was very surprised to find that many of the best practices I'd, I'd learned about working with Korean developers applied uh, in Western markets, although you have to change them. So my, um, kind of my specialization is around monetization, and that, that's the one area that I've focused on predominantly. Uh, I prefer to come and learn about what's happening in Asia because I feel like Asia is five to ten years ahead of what the U.S. is doing at any given time. So it's a pleasure to be here. Now, Kabam, I'll tell you a little bit about Kabam and, and why I'm so excited to be working in this space right now. Uh, so Kabam was founded in 2006. It actually started out focused on being kind of like a LinkedIn property, which is a social network for professionals. and basically trying their way into a couple different directions, they ultimately ended up focusing on community. That's their specialty. And in 2009, uh, our CEO, Kevin Chu, transitioned the company into being a developer of games with Kingdoms of Camelot. He was actually the designer of Kingdoms of Camelot. And they were very much excited about uh, games in the US market, like Ebony, which were kind of Western ports of Chinese strategy games, SLGs. Um, and so they played those games ridiculously, religiously, and they ended up coming up with their own belief on how to make them a Western product, and the, the rest is somewhat history. I joined about a, a month after the company launched Camelot. At the time, we were at 30 people. The company was not profitable. Uh, within two months, we had hit our, our growth projections for the year. Uh, within a year, we had scaled to about 300 people. Within two years, we'd hit 500 people. and. Well, 450 plus uh, 50 open heads that we're currently hiring for. So the company is quite large. Along the way, we've um, taken capital from Google and Intel. SK Telecom is also a very key partner. And uh, we've had all of our initial investors kind of participate. And what's really exciting about what's happening, at least in the Western markets, is it does feel like there's a, um, an enormous amount of disruption happening. And this is why this is actually my favorite job on many levels. Um, not only do you have business model disruption happening in Western markets where traditional package products are no longer relevant, but you're also seeing mobile take off, explode, social take off, explode. And so the, the whole notion of going to a store, uh, like a retail store in the United States or in Europe, 
to buy a box product. It's feeling somewhat out of date. And the explosive growth of iTunes, or in the US, Netflix, which is a, uh, both a DVD rental, but increasingly so a streaming video service, uh, point to a future of gaming which is much more similar to what you folks are familiar with here in Asia. Um, at the same time, it also feels like the level of global competition is rising. And so companies like DNA, GRI, Shonda, um, I think Activision Blizzard is also competing in this level. They're starting to compete at a global level with global IP. And it's really the first time in a long while that that's happened. And uh, it'll be exciting to see the battle kind of unfold. So locations. Um, and I'm going to kind of power through the company slides a little bit more to get to the meat of the presentation. But uh, we started our operations in the San Francisco area, actually in a small, uh, perhaps ironically, a small uh, office that was above a dim sum shop. And that we've moved a couple times since then. We also have an office in Luxembourg, which is about 60 folks. And then we have an uh, office in Beijing, which is the studio that produced uh, Kingdoms of Camelot Battle for the North. And we just started an office in Austin, Texas. The one thing that's in common with all these countries is they have great barbecue. <laughs> um, Kabam China, this is our Kabam China office. Um, kind of key to the operating success of this was um, on the studio side, sending over one of our co-founders. Um, a really kind of unique quality of, of Kabam is that many of the co-founders are, are Taiwanese American. Um, they're culturally uh, Chinese. Um, they are able to kind of work between the Eastern and Western markets more effectively. And uh, for Mike Lee in particular, um, it was very important, um, given that he had worked on the original Camelot, to transfer that knowledge into the first mobile product we did so that we were really focused on just executing well on the platform. The office leadership is also bicultural. We've always believed this is a very important trait. Um, increasingly, we're moving to a model where it's bicultural, but starting with uh, Chinese, Chinese ethnicity. So we're looking for people that are more Chinese who have learned English. Um, and we've had a bunch of great hires recently. And then it's three teams, about 60 people. And that, that includes the management for the office and everything there. Um, and it's a fully empowered team, which I think is very important. In general, when we think about product development, or live operations, we really think about what are the information flows that are needed in order for the product to be successful once it goes live. Uh, in Western companies, it's more of a package product mentality where they think about a game being something that you do finish and then kind of throw over the fence. And as any of you know that's working on live products, you just can't do that. You need to be able to get feedback from the marketplace, talk to consumers, and bake that into the product. So Kingdoms of Camelot. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you folks are familiar with this IP. It, one of the, the weaknesses of Kabam, I'd say, is we don't talk very much publicly about our success. Uh, Kingdoms of Camelot is actually an enormous franchise. It was first released in 2009 on Facebook. It was the first core game to be launched on Facebook. Um, it redefined the category and the definition of gaming. Up until that point, everyone believed that only Zynga casual games would be successful on Facebook. The second game in the franchise, uh, Umbrella, launched on iOS in 2012. We'll talk more about that. The game already is a top 10 strategy game of all time. So within two years, two and a half years, the game is top 10 grossing worldwide, uh, well, by Western definition, eFigs. And it's astounding that it's that large. Um, when we saw it kind of take off and grow, it was one of those things where we, we were basically just trying to keep up with how excited players were to play the game. And now that it's large, we, we are kind of awed and humbled by its success. And, and so it's, it's really exciting to be able to share that. Um, 20 million users. So it's actually not a ginormous game in, in terms of reach. This is a very core audience of really engaged players. So its uh, monetization characteristics are more like DNA or GRI. And then uh, we're also very fortunate in our first year, our first full year, to be kind of nominated for a Reader's Choice Award um, by traditional console gamers, which is very unusual. Um, it kind of speaks to the evolution that's happening right now in, in Western markets. So what is Kingdoms of Camelot Battle for the North? This is the iOS game. And this is our first push onto mobile um, built from the Beijing office. Um, we put a lot of thought into defining what the franchise means um, 
because if you look at KOC, there are actually a number of people that have tried to copy it over the last two to three years and not been able to do it successfully. And it's a little bit of the magic that Kevin, our CEO, put into the product, but it's also just the way that it was executed is kind of internally consistent and uh, robust. So uh, the game is ultimately very similar to the SLG or strategy simulation games in this market. I would say if you look at the generations or eras of games that have emerged in that genre in Asian markets, Kings of Camelot is more similar to the first generation of titles in Asia. So um, there's no cooldown timers. Most of the progression in the game happens time-based, so you're waiting for the result to happen. Um, the game is an MMO in that you are playing real-time with other players in a persistent world. Um, it is a consequential game design where choices you make in the game have consequence on other players. So if you attack someone, there's very likely a chance that they or their alliance will attack you in retribution. Um, we encourage that. We think it's a lot of fun. Alliance gameplay is kind of the key enabler for elder game monetization. And, uh, so we, and that, that's an area that we focus on substantially. And it's actually one of the areas that comes from the way that Kabam started as a community application developer. And ultimately, you're building castles, you're building cities to train troops to go to war to uh, basically crush your opponents. And in KVN, it's not much different, or KOC Battle for the North, as we call it. Yeah, I would also say, before we get too far into it, KOC Battle for the North is probably the longest titled game on, on the App Store, and uh, we'll continue to push longer names with our newer titles. It's kind of ridiculous in length. So here is uh, App Annie stats on KOC. So we launched around December. Uh, in Canada, there's a very common practice in Western markets to do a Canadian beta, uh, so a different version of CBT. Canadian beta means that you're running the product in Canada, you're getting feedback from English-speaking users, um, and you're protecting the launch of the product from larger markets like the UK and the US, and you're also avoiding the upfront cost of localization, so having to go to all the other fixed markets. Um, and very early we were able to determine that the game was, it was going to be successful. I think within a week or two we knew that we had a hit on our hands. And uh, what we did thereafter was actually we slowed down, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, for us, this franchise is so important. And with the, t the team in China just working incredibly hard to make it robust, scalable application on a platform mobile that we hadn't known, uh, that we didn't know much about, we wanted to make sure that it was fully optimized before we went live. Once we decided to go live, um, you can see the results here. So I wasn't able to go all the way back historically, and I apologize for that, but you can see within a few short weeks, the game went to the top of the charts. If you look at the US today, if you look at the graph today, we're number two. And uh, we've been there for quite some time. Um, we are incredibly excited about this result. And if you look across this, I actually just took a date and time. I think Germany's actually come up since I took this snapshot. But we've succeeded in getting top 10, top 25 in pretty much every uh, European or North American market. And uh, that's phenomenal when you think about the fact that there are very few people on the team that built this product that speak these languages. So the story of Kabam Mobile. Um, for us as a company, it was a very interesting pivot into mobile because prior to that point, we'd only done web development. And we really, really focused on Facebook because uh, Facebook is a phenomenal platform. One of the strengths, I think, of Kabam is that we're very good at pattern recognition. And we do that inside of our games with the way that we optimize the monetization. We do that at a strategic level by identifying opportunities. This is a, a graph that came from a 2011 uh, Morgan Stanley research report, which shows, and I'm sorry if you can't read it very clearly, it basically shows the growth of various platforms over time, starting at the launch of the platform. And the things that really stand out here are that smartphones and tablets, the f four lines at the top of the graph, are literally the fastest growing platforms of all time when you compare it to netbooks, gaming devices, MP3s, notebooks, e-readers. This is a phenomenal result. Now, naturally, smartphones and tablets are a broader use case than a gaming device, than an e-reader, but it does suggest that these are enormously disruptive events, the launch of smartphones, the launch of tablets. And we knew that we didn't have any product development allocated against mobile or, or tablet. 
uh, sorry, smartphones and tablet. And so we wanted to pursue it. We knew that we had to go there in order to continue to stay relevant and to be competitive in the marketplace. Then we also, as a company, I think are very humble at acknowledging what we're not good at and areas where we need to grow. Uh, we've become better at this over time. One of the books that kind of stands out for us is this book by Clayton Christensen, The uh, Innovator's Dilemma. If you have not read it, I'd highly recommend it. In essence, we realized that as the prior data showed, uh, tablets and smartphones would be incredibly disruptive. It was an enormous market opportunity. Um, we understood that in order for us to be successful there, we had to do a lot of learning. And the best way to approach a high growth category was to actually approach it like a startup. With our web business, it was much more mature. And taking our mature practices from web and applying them to mobile would have probably failed. And then we also realized that um, there was huge benefits actually kind of operationally siloing the effort. And it was coincident with Mike Lee having an opportunity to go to the China office and work with the team. We realized that putting Mike Lee, one of the guys that had worked on KOC, a founder of the company who understood the mechanics, had played the games an enormous number of times, was also a very passionate mobile gamer, um, could actually partner with the team in China and execute without scrutiny, without monitoring, in very much of a startup fashion, and, and that's what we did. And um, hugely powerful. In retrospect, I, I don't think we would have realized it play out this well. Um, probably the most difficult part of this project was, um, and it reflects the fact that we didn't really understand mobile. We were about two to three months late in just getting to beta launch, and that was because we had to retry and reapproach different issues or production challenges that we ran into along the way. So. Structuring for success. How do we do it? And I think this is, this is kind of the, the key playbook, if you will. So the next few slides talk about like what we did, what I think you can abstract from our process and potentially apply to the way that you do things. Um, but for anyone that's in web and looking to go mobile or in mobile looking to go to Facebook or the web, I think the key thing is to understand platform differences. We spent an enormous amount of time trying to understand how the play behavior on mobile is different. You know, it's shorter sessions, more frequent interaction. Um, payment percentages are generally higher in Western markets than on the web. That's in part due to the, the, the account information being stored in iTunes in the case of iOS. Um, also, genre mix is very different. If you look at the top 10 charts in the US or if you look at the top 10 charts on Facebook, or general web or console, the, the types of games that are successful are, are quite different. Uh, with K, KBN, KOC Battle for the North, that was the first strategy game of that style to launch on iOS. And, and so, uh, kind of pointing back to the innovator's dilemma, if we relied solely on the, the existing data for that marketplace, we wouldn't have launched. But we, we felt that the use case, the demand, the type of gamers that were on mobile phones were, were overlapping with our web audience. Then we focused on platform ex ex excellence. And um, for this, we, we uh, and especially in areas where we're not strong, um, we spend a lot of time talking to people that are strong in that space. And we try to understand, just generically or abstractly, how do they approach, um, in this case, mobile? What made you successful? What do you wish you had known when you had first started? And we just try to absorb that as much as we can. I think um, there's the one thing that I think is very exciting about the gaming space, and especially a period periods of disruption like now is that there's so many people trying things that if you can sit down and have a beer with someone and just talk about their lessons, um, you can learn a lot. And, and as a group, we can be more successful by sharing that information. So we defined what platform excellence meant for mobile. And for us, it was very much trying to incorporate the touch interaction and for simplifying the user experience. So all of the flows that were part of KOC on the web overly complicated, and, uh, too much information. We really needed to simplify in order to make the game appropriate and mass market. And then in general as a company, we optimize for learning. And so we try to set up everything so that we're uh, doing something, testing it, measuring it, building a new theory for what we could do to do it better, and then doing that. And in this case, with mobile, you can't do daily releases like you can for the web. So we had to find other ways to kind of back into that. Um, so we invested more in split test frameworks up front. Uh, we actually spent a great deal of time in trying to learn QA for mobile. It's very different from web. Um, and we had to basically adapt our entire production process to support that. 
and that was not cheap. We ended up being two or three months late as a result. Um, and then this is something that I believe very firmly, which is uh, moving slow to go fast, or uh, the most simplification is slow is fast. Um, generally speaking, I found, at least in Silicon Valley, there's a tendency to do a million different things and to be very unfocused. And the companies that are incredibly focused and very thoughtful about pointing before they shoot the gun are much more successful, generally speaking. Um, and so internally, we try to do the same thing, especially when we're queuing up resources to chase a big opportunity like this. We want that first hit to be incredibly successful, and so we take our time with it. And then, as always, be humble. Uh, recognize that you don't know it, be receptive to learning, um, and then embrace change. So I hope I pulled the right Chinese characters here. That could be wrong. I asked the China office, and it's unclear if they were trying to embarrass me or not. So hopefully that's right. Um, but I wanted to talk about how we leverage global reach. And this is actually something I've been talking a lot about with partners um, or contacts here at this conference or in the region. Uh, one of the things that I think the Asia market is very ahead of the US market in is thinking about building a product for a global audience and splitting apart the aspects of product development in a way that optimizes for uh, the lowest cost, the best um, product quality, and then the best service quality in the regions. And so in this, with this project in particular, we had a Chinese development team that only overlapped with the US office for about an hour or two every day. Um, granted, with a team that was uh, experienced with Western markets and bicultural in nature, um, but they needed to be able to push a product that was live in Western markets and respond to that feedback and deal with bugs and all the other stuff that happened. So I've touched on this point a few times, but without a doubt, um, if we hadn't replicated the success that PopCaps talked about, that Play First has talked about, by sending uh, a key member of the original team, in this case a founder, to the regional office, we would not have been able to uh, do a lot of what we did. And I, th I think that was a key success factor for the company. Um, I've touched on the bicultural functional leads. This is important on multiple levels. So a lot of the learning that happens at Kabam is, is we're very good at um, codifying learning and sharing that internally. And it all almost entirely happens through email and presentations. And when those learnings are shared, in China, it's actually hard to get those in the hands of the team, whether it's engineering uh, learning or product learning or game design learning. And so having that bicultural leadership there, they basically are, their sole purpose is to take learnings from outside of the China region and bring those into the product development process for China. And, um, our focus is much more on that than kind of managing up. Um, in general, Kabam is pretty distributed in terms of decision making and, and product development, which I think is a, is a real strength in this case. Um, also, I believe strongly, as I said before, in having teams that have to interact very frequently sit with one another. And this is one of the learnings that I kind of picked up working at EA, where one of the best changes that John Riccatello, the CEO, made was co-locating um, having the product marketing team sit with uh, the, the uh, production teams, the studios, to actually understand how the products were being built, what was great about them. In this case, we combine, uh, not surprisingly, art, design, both game and user experience, engineering, and production resources all together uh, in QA. And we put all those people together uh, with production having more of a bias towards being bicultural or American in this case, or European, um, in some cases as well. And we really just focus on them being kind of an internal pool. Then in the US, the way that we approach this project, and we didn't do this perfectly. I think this is me also kind of changing the story a little bit to tell you how we do it better this time around. Um, we did limit the interaction with the project to financing. We also did track the milestone progress, but ultimately we, we knew that we had to invest in this team with dollars and kind of support them with information and knowledge and let them execute because there wasn't much that we could do from the U.S. to help the, the 15 to 20 person team in China. Um, also because KSC is a global franchise for us and, and a big franchise um, for one that's only two years old, uh, we knew that we needed to execute in a way that was consistent. And in, actually, this was, I think, empowering for the Chen office. Because the franchise was already defined, because there was an expectation for King Arthur, Merlin, all characters that are part of the KSC franchise, um, building this product was more extending the storyline. 
And um, the way that the game is designed, a lot of the story definition happens up front, and then we allow the players to tell their own story thereafter. Um, and so Mike was able to bring the experience to the table, and then we have a global franchise owner that helped write the story, drive the narrative. UI UX, um, we used a lot of regional focus group testing and usability testing to inform whether the product would be mass market and playable. And this is also one of the reasons why we shipped a little bit late. We spent a lot of time polishing this. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that like US websites, US applications have a very different look and feel. I would even say from European applications, but certainly from Chinese applications, Japanese applications, and to a lesser extent, Korean applications. And then more so in line with the way that companies here build products and then create regional licenses, the live operations team, the service operations team in the US, and the marketing team in the US basically are the publishing effort for this project. Um, so they're providing feedback on product quality, they're providing feedback on design optimization based on consumer feedback. They're also driving channel strategy, they're driving advertising spend, and it, it actually is a model that is very similar to what you folks are familiar with, and, and I think a model that you could step into and work well with them. Um, and then consumer insights team. Uh, this is a little bit covered in the UI UX side, but we actually spend an enormous time on consumer feedback for our products. We've increased this a lot over the last year. Um, there's a tendency in the US to over-focus on quantitative analysis, and the qualitative analysis is actually the most impactful because it'll either help you identify what quantitative types of analysis you need to do, or it will point to things that players need but are unable to express. And I think that's where the, the, the power of creativity in this medium comes from, is not so much seeing a graph and being able to optimize it, which is certainly important, but it's being able to talk to a consumer, hear what they're saying, and provide them with something they'll like. Um, that's, I think that's an art. Now, making it work, there are tons of challenges along the way. And uh, I will not lie, it was not the easiest product launch. Um, so the first one seems obvious. We were developing a mobile game. Uh, it's not a web game. And uh, also, with the way at least product development works at our company, because it's such a long effort, it can be six to 12 months, um, it's really helpful to set upfront expectations for what success looks like, and then to watch that, that, to constantly refer back to what those success definitions are as you get later into the development cycle. Um, as you get closer to ship, there's incredible pressure to start getting consumer feedback and to launch and scale the app. And sometimes that's not the right choice. Uh, we talked about that, so I'll skip it. Um, I didn't talk uh, that much about our EU office, but we also use them to provide feedback in the regions. We've not done as good a job of this of late. Uh, sometimes the company can be a little bit too American, but this is an area that I'm really excited about investing in and growing um, and kind of finding a parallel publishing structure for Europe. But um, certainly in this case, uh, FIGS is an important region for us, and we, we spent a lot of time increasingly so, tailoring the product to those markets and tailoring the service ops, the live operations inside the game to those, those markets. Making it feel Western, I touched on these points a little bit, but franchise pillar definition, if you're working with a new IP, I think you want to use consumer in insights or consumer feedback on the game that you're building for Western markets to make sure that it'll have appeal. There are a lot of very subtle things to the execution that can make the game not feel good, although it's a good product. Uh, invest heavily in product quality. It's a no-brainer. I think the teams out here are very well aware of that. And then with mobile in particular, you've got to plan each release with extreme care because you need it to be successful. And anything you can do to kind of split test your learnings before you do a major release um, is incredibly leveraged. And then also take time with CBT and OBT. Um, one, and, and for foreign development teams, also invest heavily in error logging and uh, client-side diagnostics, because that'll help you figure out when something's wrong, and it'll also allow you to fix the problems if you're not able to actually test the game in the market where it's being distributed. And then I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'll blast through this, um, but leverage the local publishing teams very heavily. That's critical. Um, invest in market learning. Moving into a new market is very difficult. You're dealing with the same product and a different customer, which means that your product may not apply to that customer in its current form or the customer may behave differently in response to your product. And you really need to understand the customer before you can be successful. And then, of course, avoid making new mistakes. 
There are lots of things that you could do wrong in, in terms of regional execution. That's part of the reason why you'd want to work with a local publisher. But spending time talking to people in the region before you actually throw marketing dollars at a product, that is super smart. I, I would highly recommend that. And then for command, where are we going? Uh, so we're super psyched. One of the benefits of being our scale is that we're able to invest very aggressively in growth, um, especially when we see it. So we're going to bring about six plus mobile, mobile games to market this year. Um, that may be low. Um, we're going to expand to Android with Mobage. We have a great partnership with them very, uh, via the Mobage platform. So it's DNA, sorry. Very excited about the partnership with DNA and working on the Mobage platform. Um, and also hope to leverage that relationship to get into other markets. And then we are going to double down on iOS ridiculously uh, because we've just had great success there. So that is that. Hopefully that was helpful. Any questions? Yep, yeah, please. It's kind of a big question. So just a quick, uh, a quick insight into the things that are most different about building the core rather yeah. than casual. Yes. Oh, OK. Um, so it's very different. Uh, casual game development is very content driven. So I think the easiest way to answer the question is, is uh, what you focus on. Right? With casuals, the more casual gaming use cases tend to be around collection or collaboration. And the Facebook platform is really supportive of that because there's so much uh, social functionality baked into the platform. Uh, the same could be f uh, said for many of the SNSs in this market. Um, anything that's kind of punitive in nature or overtly comp competitive will ultimately kind of not be mass market. And with casual products, you need to be super mass market to get to scale and to get to profitability. Um, so like a, a good example in the Western market, although I don't think Zynga would agree with this, but like Fishville, for example, had fish dying, right? And it was, very, it was considered very punitive. And it certainly helped with the monetization, but it wasn't one of their bigger titles. Um, most of the casual guys have kind of pulled away from that. Now on the core side, the primary use case is more around competition and winning um, for social status. So social status and casual is more about your, the size of your collection, the completeness of your collection, how much you've helped other people or just progressed within the game. On the, on the core side, it's much more about how much you've won. And uh, so traditional notions of like uh, kill ratios or kills from like an FPS are probably a better metaphor. The designs tend to be more consequential. So if you and I fight, it's zero sum. You beat me. You take all my stuff. I get mad. I spend money. And then we battle. And that's very much the case. Also, the thematic expressions are very different. You know, there are, some, there are very few games, I think, that have been able to take a core mechanic and put a very casual veneer on it. And I think that that represents basically the audience. Like, Generally, people use the theme as a proxy for the type of gameplay they're going to get behind it. And you're kind of baiting and switching them if you um, show them a really cute animal and then you're just killing everything. Or same is also true for like using super sexy girls to try to get people into the game. Oftentimes, that doesn't perform because people think it's a different type of product <laughs> and then are surprised to find it's a game. So hopefully, that answers your question. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.